detail, maintenance, management, and consulting services. The team at Brandy Group is all about making your brand better by giving you peace of mind in the service you are receiving. And I've invited both their CEO and president. CEO is Michael Curlin, and their president is John Thomas. Gentlemen, welcome to Critical Mass Radio Show and Podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you. It's good to have you both in the studio. All right, let's start with my question about your authenticity. You know, if you maybe Michael, you could start by telling us about your firm. What makes the branded group unique and different in the minds of your clients, your employees, and your prospects? So we're a, a nationwide maintenance and facilities company. To kind of sum it up. We do. We're the broker to fix toilets for some of our clients across the country but we don't actually fix them we just broker it so what makes us different because there's about a thousand companies just like us out there in the industry is our commitment to our employees our customers our vendor partners and our community uh, we chose about 2014 we opened and we decided that it was great to turn a profit, but we were making money on fixing toilets that didn't make me feel happy inside when I was going home and putting my head <laughs> on the pillow. So we decided to put um, purpose before profit, and uh, we have several nonprofit partners in Orange County. We partner with Habitat for Humanity uh, from Orange County and Suffolk County, New York, because we have some satellite offices there, mm -hmm. uh, Second Harvest Food Bank, and also the Children's Bureau. So. Our vision is to create uh, better humanitarian leaders um, in, in, for the future. And you show that prominently on your website and in your branding and your positioning of your company. Have you found that to help you to attract your employees? Is it a part of how you've built the culture? Can you take us a little deeper on that as well? Uh, well, for our clients, it helps us ma maintain and, and attract clients because we offer a one-for-one -one program. Uh, which has evolved over the years, but its an initial uh, program was every service call that we completed for every single one of our clients, we donated a minute of time through our employees hmm. to these uh, various uh, nonprofits. Uh, and then for our employees, they you know spend around eight to sixteen hours a year uh, giving back through these programs, and you know it's paid for through us, and and they get to go out into the community and. The Second Harvest Food Pantry, for example, we did that in Orange back in uh, after Memorial Day weekend, and we sponsored an entire uh, food pantry truck in the community, and we gave away, I want to say, 7,700 pounds of food to uh, the local community, which uh, to have 15 employees on site that morning uh, at the day after Memorial Day weekend to, to do some stuff like that, they just had a great feeling in their heart that their company cares more about just turning a profit right and we're that's michael curlin he is ceo are you also the founder of, of the company yes i say am. so take me back to why this area what what is it about this niche that that you saw as attractive is it your background that predates the starting of the company or just give us a context for why so me and john uh founded the company with our other partner kira uh, Blonzi, and this was back in 2014. We were all working at a similar company in the industry back in New York together, uh, talking, you know, how we could be better. And, <laughs> yeah. and that's that's really where our motto yep. was. That is was your motto, right? Yeah, that's yeah. our motto, and that's where it was spawned. So, um, you know, we, we saw all that we learned, we cut our teeth, and, and me and John also were retailers beforehand. So I worked at uh, Jones Apparel Group, which was also Nine West there. Rest in peace, they're all bankrupt. But, uh, and John, John was at Nextel Sprint. So yeah. we got to see it from the other side of the fence as well. We were facility managers. And um, we, you know, we worked at the other company all together and we saw all the stuff that we needed to learn how to run a business. We also saw the stuff we didn't want to do and all the mistakes we didn't want to repeat. Okay. So we wanted to hashtag be better, and that's where it came from. So what does be better mean today for your culture? How, how does that, because, you again, that's that's a prominent feature of your company publicly and I'm sure privately within the culture of the company. So how do you make that operational for your employees, the term be better? Well, for our employees, it's just treating them better. At the last place we were at, it was – Basically, you know, the, the owners took every cent they could off the table and put it in their pocket. And, you know, we were an afterthought. We were lucky to get our paycheck. Mm. And, you know, I'm not faulting them. That's how some companies are run. But 
their employee retention rate was, uh, I don't know what the exact number was. One could guess. Less, yeah. less than 50. I yeah, I would say. That's uh, John's uh, voice in the yeah, background. Yeah. yeah. I would say about 50%. And uh -huh. at Brandon Group, we're clipping at 97% retention rate. Wow. So, yeah. And how, how many employees do you have now? Uh, we're north of 80, 80. Wow. Wow. I don't know the exact number. Congratulations. Yeah. And as we were talking before we got on the air, you're bootstrapping the growth of this company. You're doing organically from the operations and the profit and the growth. So that, that really puts a certain challenge on you, your partners to, you know, choose to reinvest in the business versus take it out and mm -hmm. for some other personal reason, maybe. Absolutely. Uh, cars are cool, but having right. employees that want to come to work and are happy and willing to go to, to that extra mile for you is cooler. So. Right. And that, that may be part of the reason for your success and your ability of being recognized as best places to work in Orange County, right? That's happened twice now for you. Is that true? Two, two times? Yes. So so that's a that's a statement that the employees are willing to, one, participate in the assessment and two, respond in a way that ranks you above a lot of the other companies who could compete for that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've won quite a few accolades over our almost six year history, but uh, that is the award that we're most uh, proud of, especially for the last two years running the best place to work. So, And I think I saw that you also compete, you, you were selected for the Civic 50. Is that, am I correct in that? Did you? Yes. I think you did because that, we've had the people who run the Civic 50 here at Orange County Business Journal 1OC talking about that award. I think that's an amazing award showing companies who are making a positive impact back on the community, who are giving back into the community to make it better for others. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what is that facility management? Is that a hard job? You said you were in facility yeah. management. Is that, is that a challenging job for those individuals? And it, what are you doing to help them do their job better to be better? I mean, it's, it's a remarkably challenging job. I mean, especially with your uh, national retailer or restaurant or bank, any multi-site portfolio, you're responsible for anywhere from, I mean, in some cases, five to 1,500 different sites and all the issues that can go wrong with them. So depending on how they operate their real estate portfolio, you could have really, really bad days because <laughs> things break quite a bit. Yeah. So, right, yeah. Winter and bad weather and uh, cars driving through storefronts, toilets. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm sure there's always something that isn't right that needs to be addressed. Every but, day is different, which is yeah. kind of fun, but the really bad days are really bad. So, so it feels like you're disintermediating this industry. Am, am I am I safe in saying that? Either through technology or attitudinal or culture, or you're doing something that's different than what others are doing that are servicing the facility manager. Is that a fair assessment? I would say so. Yes. Yeah, right. And so, how does that how has that been received by the niche the the clients that you've engaged what, what are they saying that's different about working with the branded group than whatever firm they worked with before uh well so our uh, for our niche market i think uh, what we're doing different is again to go back to treating our employees better treating our clients better and that stuff just rubs off so when you have a 97 percent retention rate you're customers are getting to know the people that are servicing their account on a daily they're it's not turning over every three months i'm right. not training new people you know every three months i got people that have been in the seat for years now and working on the same account for years so that facility manager at that retailer gets to know our facility manager on our end and they become almost friends on a daily basis because they're going to war together every day trying to fix toilets and right. cars driving through yeah. storefronts etc so, so is this accurate the facility manager gets a problem dumped on his or her lap it needs to be fixed yesterday because of the retail nature of the environment and they're calling your people with their hair on fire or at least a sense of tension about i've got a problem i need to get it fixed or can you help me with it is that is that a fair assessment for the business model absolutely, absolutely yeah. right so having an having a calming voice and a happy employee that works for your company on the other end who then also to your point michael maybe has had a history with you and a relationship that's got to be a differentiation for you and your space absolutely it feels like it to yeah. me so congratulations gentlemen for figuring out how in a mature space right this industry has been around for a while quite a while at, at first they probably think they didn't need another supplier doing what branded group decided to do the way you decided to do it right 
Uh, I think in the beginning it was the yellow pages, but <laughs> yeah. facility management, yeah. So, right. Yeah. But as we've grown with all the other things that are available today, uh, uh, yes. Cool. So I'm. T uh, that's why I told you, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have a great show today because we're talking with Michael Curlin, who's CEO, and John Thomas, who's president. Both are co-founders, uh, with along with another partner of the brand a branded group. So you're here because of your your success your growth success you came to me because of your listing on the inc 5000 not once but twice and so i thought i want to have you guys on to talk about that success so for those in this series i'd like to ask a couple questions around growth the first one i kind of think of as a, a growth insight and maybe john you can mm. bring your voice into this one but can you think about a key strategic decision that you guys maybe made early on that has kind of proven now in hindsight to be some of the catalysts or at least enablers for the kind of growth that you're experiencing? Absolutely, yeah. I think uh, we made a lot of key decisions early on, uh, but I think one of the biggest ones for us was realizing that it's an ever-evolving market, kind of in whatever market you're in. So our process that we create, like we always try to destroy it. So we spend an enormous amount of time with a lot of people breaking what we've made okay. to make it better. Right. Yeah, that coming back again. Right. Be better. Yeah, there you go. Right. So we just spend most of the year evaluating what we've already put in place, and we try to improve upon it. Because as you scale, the systems that worked at a smaller level they may don't not work. Okay, they are. just don't. Work. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to yeah. say didn't work as well, but right. Yeah. They, they can't they handle break. it. They yeah. can't handle it. Right. Yep. So you can't assume that what you built is not going to scale to now 80 employees with all the clients. Yeah. So and we don't presume that we know everything. Like we're very, I mean, we'd like to think that we're humble guys. That might not sound humble saying it out loud, but uh, we know that we're not, you know, the guys that know everything. Mm -hmm. So we can only presume that we have to, that we've made mistakes mm -hmm. and we try to fix those constantly. So whatever I, they may be. I have to imagine and tell me if I'm wrong, that employees giving you feedback on things that need to be fixed gets a lot of attention from the leadership team. We Big have time. open door policies that, right. that's, uh, you know, if you have an idea, please come share and collaborate. It's a very collaborative space. We'll make the final decision, but we'll take all the information we can because, as John said, we know we're not always right and things are ever evolving. So if our boots on the ground are seeing the same problem over and over again, why would we not listen to them? Right, because I think um, we haven't talked about your hiring practices. Maybe sometimes you guys will come back and tell me how you vet for culture because I'm very curious because you have a very steeped and rich positive culture, which I'm curious about. Probably don't have time today to talk about it. But um, I would think that they're in a pressure cooker with their client. And if they're frustrated because your systems aren't up to the task, that just makes their job all the more difficult, which wouldn't lead them to want to work as a best places to work kind of environment. These are kind of assumptions that I'm making, but I'm sort of trying to paint the picture for you. Is, is that accurate? That yeah. listening to them and solving their problems keeps them engaged and happy and able to solve the problems for their clients as well? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's great. All right. So I've got another one called growth advice. And uh, maybe Mike will turn this one back to you if you don't mind, Michael. If you could give one suggestion or piece of advice to other entrepreneurs who are listening either today here on Critical Mass Radio Show and Podcast or later as a podcast off all the podcasting platforms. Maybe you're hearing us on iHeartRadio. Don't know. But if you could give a piece of advice, what would you offer them, Michael? I thought about this question uh, a lot, and I would say reinvest every dollar that you have to grow the business, uh, especially as a bootstrapping founder. Um, you know, your business grows very quickly, and when, you, when you're when you going from, you know, small increments in the beginning, like, it doesn't seem like that dollar, those all those dollars are going to make a difference, but as we've gotten farther and farther along, those dollars make a difference, and I said it before, cars are cool, but, you know, paying your bills on time and paying your employees and giving them raises is cooler, so. Right, and being able to fund growth. Exactly. Because I call it the entrepreneur's dilemma. I know that means a lot of things to other people, but I think of it as consistently to achieve the next revenue level, you need to invest in the business prior to getting the revenue, which mm -hmm. means that money's got to come from somewhere. Right. And that's a hard decision sometimes to make. Right. Right? Because you'd rather not spend that money unless you had the revenue already, but you can't get the revenue until you have the people. Right. And you have 80? Is that what you said earlier? 80 people? Uh, North of, yeah. yeah. And are you, where are they located? Because I know only some of them are here in, in Orange County, right? Uh, we have about 65 here in Orange County. I think we have six or seven in Vegas, and we have about 15 in uh, Long Island, New York, and then one in Kentucky. And <laughs> don't forget Kentucky. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and right? Two and three in South Carolina. I don't know how those happen. So how do you decide where to put people? Uh, New York was where we started, so we just had a lot of 
um, employ you know old coworkers back there that again great places to work were willing to come work for us right. uh, from home. Vegas, we we got lucky. We we met some people that were in in industry in the industry out of jobs, and they uh, all wanted to also work from home. Heard great things about us, and the South Carolina Kentucky people moved. And we yeah. just, oh, <laughs> okay, yeah. If you want to go live in yeah. Kentucky, go for it. So you're comfortable with employees working remotely and working from home? Absolutely. Yeah. How have you um, do do you, here in Orange County? Do you have people who come to the office as well? Oh, oh yeah. Is, okay, so it's not a completely virtual workforce. No, but we allow even the people in Orange County to work from home at least once a month. Uh, it's another perk that we try to extend right. to our, our clients, that is our be employees. That's becoming more and more valuable to employees to be have the freedom to do that should they need to. And if you hire right, they don't abuse the privilege. But it is really, I think, a differentiator when in this economy when you're competing for talent – to, to have people decide to come to work for Branded Group, I would imagine. Absolutely. And in Orange County, competing for talent right now is, it's, that, that, I think, an all-time high. Yeah. Right. Are your clients across the country, or are they and, and are they located in those markets where you said you have people, or they, are there people, are there clients in markets where you don't have people? Do you have to have people in the market? It sounds like you're servicing the nation. Yeah, it's the whole country. Okay. Um, you don't need people where the, the problems are. You just need to have professionals on the phone that can quarterback the issue. Right. But so. you, you're also connecting the facility manager to the to the tradesman, trade person who can solve the problem, right? Right. So so how do you build that? That's So you you have two sides. You kind of have – that's, a, that's a little perfect, complex yeah. model. We're the middlemen. Right. 100%. Yeah, right. About as middle as you can be. Right. But your brand is sort of also assigned to the people who do the work. Yep. Right. So you have to vet that as probably as closely or at least somewhat closely to how you vet an employee, I would think. Yeah. So so um, I, I know we're a little bit off script, but can you, John, can you maybe give me a sense for how does a, a, a service tradesman who wants to be a part of the branded group referral network, I mean, what do they have to do to demonstrate to you that you can trust them to go in and fix whatever isn't right at one of your clients well insurance requirements are nice okay yeah, gotta have those okay right um but we do have a, a vetting process and a vendor management team that goes out proactively looking for vendors usually based on like the need of the client right so if we have a new client that comes on that might have a portfolio in areas where we haven't really serviced a lot historically uh we'll look at that overlay it on where we've performed work before and then start making calls mm -hmm. and try to figure out who would want to work with us so you have to introduce yourself to them as well and demonstrate your value add yep. and um being in the middle you you know you're differentiating their experience with the client a little bit so th that's a, that's an interesting model because you need both clients who need the work and they need the people who are going to do the work and they need to have really good people in between them who can dispatch the work effortlessly and economically right correct Fantastic. So um, uh, it's a great business model, ladies and gentlemen. We have two wonderful entrepreneurs with us, Michael Curlin, CEO, and John Thomas, President, Branded Group. i got a few more questions with you guys. we got like, well, we're going to go a little bit long, probably, probably three or four minutes longer. Is that okay? All right. Let's talk about a challenge. Uh, John, maybe we'll give you this one as well, but um, can you share with our audience kind of what's the most challenging aspect you guys are facing now as you continue to lead and scale Branded Group? There's a lot, but I also had to think about this one, too, because there's a lot of challenges. <laughs> Our business is a challenge, right? Yeah. So uh, I think to be scalable, you have to be very stable. And to be stable, you have to understand every aspect of your business and all of your numbers. And we measure everything and spend a lot of time understanding our numbers. And when you're dealing as many transactions as we do every year, I mean, just for us, like we've done over 50,000 jobs you know, this year wow. and you wow. know, it's, it's a lot, right? Yeah. So, and that's just a job. So then you got all the transactions between vendors and us, you know, in the back office. So you can triple that if you want. Hmm. That's a lot of data to wrangle. So we, we do that between our analysis team. Uh, we have an executive analyst, we have a finance team, uh, and we're constantly just measuring things up, making sure we know that this little charge goes to this little job and then just repeat at a very alarmingly high volume right yeah. so i'm you're the president i'm getting a strong indication that you're sort of the operationally focused individual do on i this give that team. off <laughs> that's <laughs> just the, the competence that you're exuding about the, these kind yeah. of details it feels like you, that's your wheelhouse yeah. right i do ops and finance okay yeah. okay great um two more questions guys um 
can you share your philosophy, uh, Michael? I think this is probably a good one for you. Yeah, I, I wrote a, a book called The uh, Power of CEO Guiding Principles. I believe culture is tied to your principles. It should be. The culture of your company should be tied to your guiding principle. And so I'd like to ask founders, CEOs, um, if you could share your core philosophy that you're using to build and scale the culture of your firm. I mean, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with Be Better. I mean, that is ingrained in everything we do. It's it's the first thing you see when you walk into our office, uh, and it's the Be Better culture. And we we start that at day one with any new employee with, you know, the phil philanthropic things that we have or even just – teaching them how to do their job. There's, there's models there, there's, there's operational models that, and you know, our third founder, uh, Kira, her entire job is basically Brand Group College and they come in and she is the head professor and that's all she does <laughs> from like day one. And wow. it's just like ongoing education. So we, we realize that if we can, you know, ingrain that into, into them and, and reinvest in them, they, you know, th that, that helps build the culture with them and helps them want to be a part of the be better culture right training is so important so important critical yes making people confident that they can do the job that you've assigned them to do is really a determinant of how happy they are in their job too because if they feel overwhelmed or ill prepared to do their job they're probably going to blame the employer mm -hmm. the company for not teaching me what i need to do absolutely right and yeah. it is your responsibility Absolutely. Right. And it's, yeah. it goes back to what you were saying earlier too, with reinvestment, it's, it's such a long game, but when you're an entrepreneur, you're looking at those dollars up front and you're like, I don't want to spend money on a corporate trainer and a corporate training department. I'll just make a two week plan and here you go, you know, throw them, throw them to the wolves. Right? right. But if you really invest up front in your employees and you put them into this long game where you want to keep them for years and they know that from day one, if they, if they follow the program that we put in front of them, that they're going to be successful and they can build a career out of this, then you got people that are there long term and it saves you so much money in the long run. Wow. That's awesome. You guys are awesome. I knew this was going to be a good interview. Thank nice. you for sharing. I guess I lied. I have two more questions. I keep saying I got two more questions, two more <laughs> questions. More. You guys, what the hell's going on here? Um, what's the future hold? And John, maybe I'll throw this one to you. You know, you're here today. We've kind of modeled where you are as far as size and scope. What you come back in two or three years or a year, what's going to be different, John? I mean, I, when we were talking about this before, this is the question that I really don't like because okay. it's, uh, right. you know, like, how do you answer that? Right. We're going to be around, yeah, that's good. Okay. But uh, I think for us, uh, the goal is to continue pushing ourselves to grow the business in a safe and stable way. Uh, we're not making any crazy moves or doing anything like out of character to go for more explosive growth. That's kind of already happened with us just keeping our principles in line. So mm -hmm. it's about keeping the fundamentals and the principles uh right where they need to be and then ripping apart our process like i mentioned before mm -hmm. uh and keeping that stable growth throughout the years and ultimately just driving back to the community all the stuff that we've been able to dump in already right and developing our professionals to you know take our jobs one day that's a challenge yeah right that will be a challenge but that's one that's good that you recognize that early because it takes a long time to do that mm -hmm. so we are going to have you both back if you're willing to come back and share a little bit more i'd really like to pick apart your culture a little bit more and how you use how do you hire to culture because i would assume you have to be thoughtful about bringing people on board and making sure you get people who want to be in your kind of culture so would you come back sometime Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, Joan, our producer, will get back in touch with you, and we'll see when it's available for you. So, if someone would like like to learn more about Branded Group, how do they find you online? Uh, www.branded-group.com is our website. Um, www.facebook.com backslash Branded Group for Facebook, and Twitter.com backslash The Branded Group is how they can find us okay i keep saying i'm finished but i have one more question the name uh, how did you guys come up with branded group what what's the significance of it <laughs> this one is uh, this have, this is like an ongoing question that i have had to answer <laughs> for six years yeah. because when we first started everyone thought it was brandon group and okay. I, everyone brandon. thought i was brandon right. yes <laughs> but no so the Retailers, uh, brick and mortar retailers are pretty much our number one uh, clientele. And there's a saying in retail that is uh, up to brand standard. So if you walk into any 
you know, Apple Store, they all look the same because they're they're on brand standard. So, the branded group. Oh, okay. We keep your stores brand standard. So to your prospects and to your clients, that that has meaning deeper than it the makes general sense. population. It right? makes sense to our clients, but right. to everybody else, they think I'm Brandon. Okay. So. Well, <laughs> we know you're not. So Michael and John, thank you very much for being a part of the Critical Mass community, sharing a bit of what you know and the, the successful company that you're building. It's really great to have you on the program, and I wish you nothing but continued success in the new year. Thanks for having us. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd like to also thank our engineer, Mr. Paul Roberts. We couldn't do the show without our three producers as well. Joan Park, Crystal Nunley, our newest producer who's here in the studio. Can't see her, but she is Vanessa Holland. If you'd like to connect with me, let's start on LinkedIn. I'm Richard Franzi, F-R-A-N-Z-I. Until the next show, I hope all of your business decisions will move your company in a positive direction.